us pray. Let us pray. So Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, particularly at such a time as this. A time where there's so much confusion, where the enemy is attacking even the very believers. But here we are, we still have hope in your world. We still have comfort in your world. And we still have courage in your world. This in itself is a miracle. It's a miracle that at such a time as this, we still believe the efficacy and the power in the world of, in your world. Father, we give you thanks. I pray in the name of Jesus that as we continue the studies of Ephesians 6, this day, I ask the spirit of truth to open our eyes yet more, teach us yet more, and use my very mere human voice to amplify the very eternal word of truth, eternal word of hope, eternal word of life, in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that our heights of understanding will be enlightened, that we will know the confident hope we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we will be wise, wise in the application of the word of truth, wise in our ramification and in all implications in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that we will be wise and we will not be ignorant of the devices of the evil one, even at this evil time. In Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that you will continue to hope, uphold us the same way your prayers uphold Peter and his faith did not fail. I pray, Lord, that your grace will continue to uphold us so that our faith will not fail, even at trying times, even as many tantrums have been going, are going around javelins, arrows, are going around I pray, Lord, that our fail, our faith will not fail. I ask, Lord, for the courage to hold on to the shield of faith, wherewith all fairy doubt will be quenched in Jesus' name. I pray for that person today, whose mind is in disarray, whose mind is in confusion. I pray for that weak person today, who is already battered with life. I pray for that person who whose heart is broken right now. I pray that you will take comfort in the shield of faith of the brethren and that will give you grace to heal up and heal up very fast. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. All right, welcome to today's class. I thought this was just a little project that I was just going to dash in and dash out and just teach and forget. But the more I sit on this class, the more it's expanding. I, I, I think I, have to, I want to run away because this job is expanding in my hand. I thought I was going to come today and just wrap up the three uh, remaining weapon of warfare, the three remaining hammer of God. But unfortunately, I cannot even go beyond verse 16 today. Just one verse. We're going to be expanding one verse today. We're going to expand it with the help of the Spirit. And with that clear explanation, you will have clear implication and you will have clear application. I wish this was how the Bible was being taught in my country in the last 10 years. Our Christianity would have been more fruitful and productive. But it is better late than never. Thanks be to God who loves us and who is bringing this truth to us by his very grace. Anyway, because this work is, <laughs> is a special one, let's get into work. Let's get into class. Perhaps you are joining this class for the first time. This is a series of teaching that has been going on. This is part three of the hammer of God. For you to properly understand part three, I would suggest, please, get back to part one. Take your time, listen to part one, part two, then continue your part three. This is a sequential uh, teaching. It's like series. It starts from foundation, one, two, three. If you join in between, yeah, you will understand some grammar I'm speaking, but you need to start from the beginning to be able to draw a proper conclusion. 
please let's be disciplined to do that. Um, in the last class, we started speaking on the weapon of warfare, and according to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14, 15, 16, 17, it shows to us that there are six weapons of spiritual warfare. Some people may, by implication, they may bring seven. But for the purpose of these studies, I'm going to focus on six. That is expressly written, not by implication. So, like I said, we said at the first class, these weapons has been tried, tested, and trusted. This weapon has been proven by our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when we began, when we began to speak about spiritual warfare, it looks so simple. See, the, the weapons of our warfare are powerful. They are mighty. through pulling down of stronghold, but they are very simple. And the way the human mind is wired, we are wired to value complex and complicated things. But we are not God, and God is not man. All these weapons were what Jesus, our Lord Jesus used to defeat the enemy. Hebrews 4, it was tried in all ramification. Hebrews 4, 15, but did not sin. 1 John 3, he came to destroy the works of the enemy. He did that. If he did not destroy the works of the, works of the enemy, today we will not be talking about the gospel. Because Ephesians 2, 1 said, before we were born again, we were dead in our sin and trespasses. And when you say, when you say something is dead, then you can draw a parallel from Lazarus. Lazarus in John 11 was dead. Therefore, he was deaf. He was dead and all his internal organs had collapsed. That's the, the example of Lazarus is a typical example of someone who is not born again. He or she is dead. And that person cannot respond to the word of God. You might know it scholastically. That's why there are CRS teachers who teach CRS or CRK, but they're not born again. Because it's just, at that point, it's a piece of literature. And anybody can pick a piece of literature and analyze. It's called, crit it's called critique. You can pick any piece of literature and do a critique and philosophically build a case, build an argument. You can speak for or you can speak against. Anybody can do that. But if you are really, really born again, you're not doing critique. The book is transforming you. A CRS teacher who is not born again can teach CRS to students preparing for YEC. And they will go right to YEC and they will pass. But the person who taught them CRS is not born again because that is just a piece of literature. It's not different from teaching them um, Twelfth Nights or teaching them Machat of Venice. Machat of Venice is also a piece of literature. So you look at the poets, you look at the gene, you look at the prose, metaphor, simile, personification. You look at the uh, onomatopoeia. <laughs> you look at all those literary stories and analyze. So you, you read a passage, you draw the theme, you draw the summary, you look at the central character, you look at the message that is being communicated, that's literature. And you go right where can you pass? You can pick any piece of literature like that. You can pick the book of Genesis and look at the story of Joseph and just look at main character, look at the prose in the character, in the passage, you look at the similes, the figures of speech. How many figures of speech do you have in Genesis 35? You read, go through it. You see David and jo Joseph will dream about animals. And that animals will be interpreted as the cup bearer. That's personification. You can also see the use of simile. Simile as or like, as, as good as it is, sim, uh, comparing and contrasting two, uh, two similarities. You can also do that in, in the book of Genesis. You can pick that, you can do that in the book of Roots. You can see the drama. You can look at the book of Roots as drama, a dialogue drama, and pick drama from uh, the cast. The, 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 look at, bring three main cast, Ruth, Naomi, Opa. Then, when it's, roots, when it's time for Naomi to talk, you see that there's a drama, there's, a, there's an interlogue, a dialogue, sorry. <clears throat> it's a dialogue in the Book of Roots. That's just a piece of literature. You need to be redeemed to look at the Book of Roots 
and see Christ. Anybody can pick a piece of literature and analyze, but you have to be redeemed to see Christ. So if today we are looking at the scripture and we are seeing Christ, it's because we are born again. And it's because Christ has done his work. If Christ had not disarmed Satan, there's no way we'll pick this Bible and see Christ. Some people printed the Bible. Some people did the type setting. And still they remain unconverted. Why some of us pick the Bible and we can see Christ? Because Christ has disarmed the enemy. So he proved a proof test to show that Christ really has disarmed the enemy is because today you are also listening to the word of God. You, are, you have delight in the word of God. You are enjoying the word of God. The word of God is inspiring you daily. And the word of God, and you are submitting to the correction and to the truth of the word of God. If you are not submitting to the correction and to the truth of the word of God, maybe you are not born again. So, Jesus has proven that this weapon of warfare uh, can be trusted and can be relied upon. Can be relied upon. Jesus has proven that. And if Jesus has proven that, then let us also study this weapon so we can put them to use. I was surprised in the last class that people are looking at, I mean, I saw the interaction that came from the last class where people were writing that as simple as truth. It's a weapon of warfare. Yes, it is. Let's go again into today's class and let's take a quick review. In the last class, we spoke about the first three pieces of uh, hammer of God. We spoke about the belt of truth, we spoke about the breastplate of righteousness, and we spoke about the shoe. These three things are pointing to genuine conversion. Brothers and sisters, if you have not met the true biblical Jesus, don't talk about spiritual warfare. That is the progression. Paul, the writer here, writing to Ephesus, to Ephesians Christians, whom he knew were in the midst of spiritual battle. Now, writing to them, the first three things he wrote, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes, are not things you can take away. They are things that are permanently put on by a soldier in battle. There are weapons that a, a military man or the Roman soldier always have on when they are in battle. Then he flipped to the other side, sheet of faith, element of salvation, the sword of the spirit. These are not things you have permanently on. These are things you engage when the battle is on. So today we, are to, we will be talking about one of those things, which is the sheet of faith. But if you look at the way Paul wrote this uh, armor of God, it did not start with the shield of it. It did not start with the element of salvation. It did not start with sword of the spirit. First, it started with truth, righteousness, gospel. You know why? Before you start talking about engaging, you have to be born again. That is what Paul is saying here. Superficial faith cannot survive spiritual warfare. You find people going to mountains, from mountains to mountains, who are not born again. So what deliverance are you looking for? You find people who dipped their hand into occult, and consequentially, the occult, the covenant they've dipped their hand into is coming after them. Then they are going to prophet to pray. Pray about what? Jesus said a parable in Matthew 12, 43 and 44. Of course, it's a parable, but that parable has a lot of meaning. He said that when an evil spirit leaves a person, the evil spirit goes around, and when he finds out that that house is clean, garnished, he will say to himself in verse 44, I will come back to my house. You know why he said that? Because that person is still in the possession of the devil. But an unbeliever can be delivered when 
a believer prays in the name of Jesus. Although it's not guaranteed, but because there's power in the name of Jesus, it is very possible for you to pray for someone who is demon-possessed and in the authority of the name of Jesus, that demon will leave. It doesn't mean that person is redeemed. It's just that the, a superior power over, overpowers that it happened when Jesus sent out, his, sent out his disciples two by two. They came back and said the, demon, as the demons are subjected to us. Those people that, uh, that they casted out demons from didn't become born again. But because they went in the authority of Jesus, they set those demons free. But then Jesus is not saying this parable that when that demon leaves, he wanders around, he finds out that that house is clean because they sent him away. And the house remained clean. He said the demon will come back with seven more deadly demons because that house belonged to him. So the best, according to the Bible, is that if we are not born again, don't talk about spiritual warfare. That is the starting point. Genuine conversion is the very foundation of spiritual warfare, of spiritual battle. So if you look at what Paul wrote, the first three was pointed to being born again and the genuineness of it. I was talking to conversion and the genuineness of it was eradicating superficial conversion. Then the next point, he went to shield of faith I went to helmet of salvation. I went to the sword of the spirit. Then if you have this genuine conversion, then you can engage. If you have this thing permanently won, then you can engage. Don't forget again, this is a review class. Or at this time, it's review time. Don't forget to take another review. We spoke about the use of metaphor. What's a metaphor? A metaphor is a figure of speech that directly refers to one thing by mentioning another metaphor. So in this case, Paul is mentioning soldier, the Roman soldier, to explain the concept of spiritual warfare. He's using the concept of the Roman soldier. So we really, we really have to understand what a Roman soldier looks like for us to be able to decode what Paul is writing about. And in the last two classes, we spoke about what belt does, it holds things together. We spoke about what breastplate, it protects vital organ. And we spoke about shoes, which, is to, is it, which, is, which means to be battled ready. So today we are going to warm up of those things, which is, which is the helmet of, which is, which is the sheet of it. Another way to look at these things, look at mathematics. In mathematics, you have um, examples. If you are able to solve those examples, you'll be able to solve the question. In examples, we see patterns, we see models, we see steps. That is needed to solve the question. So in this spiritual battle, Paul is giving us an image of a soldier. That is another way to look at the use of metaphor. Paul is giving us the image of a soldier. When we look at it properly, the way Paul wants us to look at it, we'll be able to interpret it into our spiritual battle. Verse 16, Ephesians 6, 16, from NKJV. I'm going to read 16, 17, 18, but today we're going to focus on 16. Above all, taking the shade of it, with which you'll be able to quench all the fairy darts of the wicked one, and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of, word of God. So in these two verses, you find out, you find sheet of faith, find, you're going to find element of salvation, and you're going to find the sword of the spirit. Let's first see the use of sword or the use of shield in the Roman army. Because many of times we just read this thing and we just go, what does a shield look like in the Roman army? I did my research yesterday and I saw about three documents that explained what this shield look like. The shield is about 2.5 feet by 4.5 feet. 2.5 feet. A feet is 12 inches. So 12 times 2, 24.5. So uh, 24 plus 12. 
which is about 36. So it's about 36 inches wide, which is like a yard. You call it yard in Nigeria huh? when you want to buy clothes. One yard. It's about one yard by two yards. So think about it. The shield, a Roman soldier shield, is about one yard by two yards. So the length is about one yard of your clothes. Then the breadth is about two yards. That is going to perfectly protect the soldier. Because the shield now, look at the length of that now. You know we can sew clothes with two yards. Now, look at stretching two yards of clothes to stand tall. That's going to protect you. Every human, every soldier, the individual, is going to protect him because it's big enough, wide enough to protect the soldier from arrows. And that shield is made of strong materials that, it, that, is, that is impenetrable. So, this Roman soldier, when they go to war, they have that by their side. When the battle, when the battle is getting hot, they pick up that shield and hide behind it so that the enemy's arrow will, be, will not penetrate them. The arrow falls away. And when the enemy is out of weapon, then they can engage. So the shield is for protection, then they engage. Protect and engage. Now, let's see the application of that. And okay, before we go to the application, another thing that the soldiers do is that the shield is used for protecting the individual soldier. But the strength of that shield is in harmony. So all the soldiers come and form a long wall. Yes, it can protect the individual soldier, but it is stronger. The shield is more stronger when they form, when they come in harmony, when they come in unity. The shield protects and forms a long wall. And in that long wall, all the fairy arrows, javelin, uh, stones, or flying weapon that their enemies may be firing at them will be impenetrable. It's going to fall off. It doesn't mean that the enemies will not shoot at them. The enemies will shoot at them, but the arrows will fall off. It's, it will become impenetrable. So having understood that metaphor that Paul is trying to say. Now let's look at, let's look at the implication or the application of this to horse now, reading Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, when Paul says the shield of faith, what do you understand by the word shield of faith? Or that word faith, what do you understand? Because previously, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13, Paul just spoke about faith. This is under the gifts evangelists, and apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The five gifts or four, whatever you want to stand, that Christ gave to the church. Verse 13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man and to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention to the word faith here, it's not the same with the word faith in chapter 6, verse 16. In chapter 6, verse 16, it calls it sheet of faith, not sheet of defeat. In chapter 4, verse 13, it says, the unity of the faith. See that word definite article, that T-H-E, changes the narrative. There's a difference between the faith and faith. This is the class, so I want you to pay close attention. There's a difference between the faith and faith. What is the difference between the faith and faith? In a First Timothy chapter four verses one, Paul said, "At a lot of times, some will depart from defeat." Do chapter one verse thirty. Let us therefore contend for defeats. 
If you look at Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. If you look at our word hand there, it's called kai, which means by implication, the unity of the faith, which is the knowledge of the Son of God. So it's like saying our president is the Buhari is the president and commander in chief of the armed forces. You find he said unity of the faith and of the knowledge. The same thing is connected with the use of hand, which means the faith is the knowledge of Christ. So we call the faith, whenever you find the word the faith in the New Testament, is talking about the body of truth upon which the New Testament is established. We call it the doctrine. The faith is the body of truth upon which the New Testament is established. So we are called the people of the faith. Jude said, let us contend for the faith. And if you look at verse 4 of Jude 1, it says some ungodly men have wandered into the church. They want to destroy this truths by bringing in destructive heresies. So you see what Jude is contrasting. Destructive heresies, which is destructive teaching, and is contrasting it with the faith, which is constructive teachings. St. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1, in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. They will depart from the New Testament teaching. Then when they depart from that New Testament teaching, what will they go into? They will go into doctrines of demons. So they will leave a particular teaching and they will go into another teaching. Paul is now calling that other teaching doctrine of demons. So what is the difference between the faith and faith? The faith is the body of the New Testament teaching or the body of truth, or Christ's explanation of the Old Testament. That is the faith. So now, what is faith? Faith is the conviction of God as revealed by the gospel. The conviction of God as revealed by the gospel is a firm, resolute dependence on the Lord. Firm, resolute dependence on the Lord. The conviction of the God that the gospel revealed, that is faith. The faith is the body of truth of the New Testament. So you see that there's, there's a difference between the faith and faith. So here, Paul is now saying, he didn't say, put on the shield of the faith. He said, put on the shield of faith. Put on a firm, resolute dependence on the Lord. So, why is Paul saying that? Why do we need that faith in a spiritual battle? Why do we need that strong conviction? Like we have it in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. And you're in the word of God. That is not the faith comes. That's faith. A conviction of the existence of God comes by paying attention to the gospel. He that comes to God, Hebrews 11 says, must first believe that he is and is the word of them that diligently seek him. A conviction of God comes from hearing the gospel. A conviction of God comes from hearing the the message of Christ. So Paul is now saying that in spiritual warfare, you need to have that conviction. It's equal to a shield, a conviction, a strong, a strong, resolute conviction of God. It's a shield that will be used to put away the fairy death of the enemy. So what is the greatest expression of this faith? What is the greatest expression of the conviction of God? Now, there's something else, before I go into this conviction, this greatest conviction 
the greatest expression of this uh, of this faith. Before I go into it, I also want to draw. I want to draw the, our first application. We are looking at application of the soldier, the Roman soldier, uh, dressing into warfare. Let's look at the first application. When the soldiers go to war, or when the battle is getting when the battle is getting hot, they pick up their shield to put away the fairy arrow of the enemy. So now, I said something. I said the strength of that shield is in unity. It forms a long antique wall. So, one of the first application of this is the protection of the church. When brethren comes together to pray, there is when brethren comes together to pray, there is protection in that gathering. Now, every soldier has his own shield. So no pastor can say, I am your covering. I am your shield. He has his own shield. You have your own shield. Every soldier has his or her own shield. And they are all equal. 2.5 inches, uh, 2.5 feet by 4.5 feet. About one yard by two yards. So if anybody says, it's your shield, I'm your covering. It's just an exaggeration. Yes, the strength of that shield is in harmony. Harmony in the sense that everybody comes together and they repel the attack of the enemy. So no one person can claim to be your protection. That is the first thing you want to learn. The second thing you want to learn is that this shield Give, every believer has shield. So imagine someone comes to the battlefront without a shield and is calling himself a Roman soldier. If you are in such in the gathering, or if you are in that battle, you are in the battle of people who don't have shield and you are looking for protection, then you are deceiving yourself because you are going to expose yourself. So what is the application of that? It is the protection of the brethren. That's why another thing you will learn from today's class is the importance of the true church. Then these are things we will also learn as we move on. The importance of true fellowship, brethren, importance of fellowship with true brethren. But don't let me go too ahead of myself. Let's get back into the discussion we are asking. And I said, what is the greatest expression of faith? Paul didn't say put on the shield of the faith. He said put on the shield of faith. So what is the greatest expression of faith? What is the greatest expression of faith? I wish this class someone can talk to me back or talk back to me. What is the greatest expression of faith? Is it going to be I believe my car, I believe my house, I believe my wife? I believe my job. <laughs> that's not the greatest expression of faith because that's not even faith. That's wishful thinking. Let's use Bible to answer Bible. Jesus speaking in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Saying, men all, all, uh, always ought to pray and not to lose heart. Saying, there was a certain city, a judge who did not fear God, nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust just said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the head?
when the Son of Man come, will he really find faith on the earth? He didn't say when the Son of Man comes, will he really find the faith? Mm -mm. He said, will he really find faith? Now, let us expand that word faith. That word faith means conviction of God. Conviction. A resolute dependence on God. That word faith means a resolute dependence on God. So you can rewrite that verse 8 and say, when the Son of Man comes, we live find people who are resolutely depending on God like this woman. This woman needed justice and she hold on. She kept praying. She kept praying. She has a resolute dependence on God. When the Son of Man comes, will he find this? Now, look at the connection. Verse 1 says, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not to lose heart. So the introduction of this teaching, of this parable, was prayers. Jesus wanted to explain prayers. And in that explanation, he jumped into a parable. By the end of that parable, he should have concluded the interaction by saying, when the Son of Man comes, we will see find people who are praying. But he did not continue. He wanted to teach on prayers. But he changed the word prayers and put faith. Why don't you start by saying, I want to teach you faith? It started by saying, I want to teach you prayers. And after the parable, it now ended on faith. Do you know why? Prayer is the greatest expression of faith. Prayer is the greatest expression of faith. In prayer, prayer is an expression of faith. In prayer, you believe there is God. In prayer, you believe there is God. You believe he answers prayers. You believe he is powerful. You put your trust in God. That's what prayer does. That is faith. At the beginning of this meeting, I pray, Lord, use my mere human voice to amplify your eternal word. How do I know it's going to be answered? Faith. The greatest expression of faith is in prayers. So Jesus wanted to teach prayers. He explained the the continuous, the continuous, constant attitude of prayers. And by the time he was done with his parable, he flipped the coin and he began to say, when the Son of Man comes, we will still find faith. In other words, if you look at the woman here who needed justice, she didn't cheat to get the justice. She didn't bribe to get the justice. She kept demanding for the justice. She kept demanding for the justice. That's an expression of faith that in talking to God, God will do his will in our lives. That is an expression of faith. It's the greatest expression of faith. And if you look at when the Holy Spirit was given the book of Acts, two things always go together. Teaching and prayer. Act 2, 42. Act 4, 32. You go to Act 6, you see prayers. You go to um, Act 12, they pray for Peter. Prayer always go together. Wherever the word of God goes, prayer follows. The word of God itself is the faith. Prayer is an expression of faith. They always go together. So Jesus speaking about prayer here concluded by calling it faith. So now, the greatest expression of faith is prayers. Verses Ephesians 6b. Above all, taking all the shade of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fairy dart of the wicked one. Let's open that word one at a time. Before I open that word, I told you that the shield of the Roman soldier works in formation, in unity. When they come together, they form a long, thick wall to repel the arrow away. Okay? So now let's look at chapter 16 and chapter 6 verse 16 B. Look at it very well. Pay attention. Above all, taking the sheet of faith with which you will be able to quench, mark that word, quench, all the fairy darts 
or mark the word quench, fairy, dart, a wicked one. Mark those four words. Quench, fairy, dart, and the wicked one. So what does it mean to quench? To quench means to extinguish fire. If you go look at the Greek definition, that's the way he put it. To quench means to extinguish fire, to put fire away. So I quench the fire. So Paul is saying that this shield of faith will quench fire. So what does it mean? What is the meaning of fairy? Fairy means to set on fire or to burn. What's the meaning of that? That means mixer, javelin, or harrow. So in the Roman armies, when they are in battle, the enemy can pick an harrow, and at the tip of the harrow, put some materials that is combustible, and shoot it with fire. And when the fire is coming to the Roman arrow, uh, I mean, the shield protects them so that the harrow and the fire cannot penetrate. So, how does this affect us? Don't forget, the greatest expression of faith is prayers. So, come bring it home now. The Roman army opposition shoots an arrow that the tip of the arrow has fire and the fire is coming. But because of the shield the army has, the arrow touches the shield, but it is impenetrable. It falls off. And what, don't forget again, the greatest expression of faith is prayers. So how do we apply this? We're going to look at three applications. How we apply this chapter 16. So I've given you clear definition of the Roman harem. I mean, I've given you the greatest expression of prayer, of faith, of faith that Paul is talking about here. So let's look at three applications. The three, let's look at three applications, how we can apply this. I know as I'm talking right now, understanding is coming to your mind. You are seeing clearly the power of prayers of a believer. You are seeing clearly what can, can happen in a believer that believes. God is not looking for a perfect person, but he's looking for a man that believes. God can do wonders through a man that believes. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were not perfect men, but they were men that believed. And that belief is accounted to them as righteousness. God can do wonders through a man that believes. You will find in James, you will find in Hebrews, a woman called Rahab. They call her Rahab the prostitute. She entered into the genealogy of Jesus because she believed. You find Ruth, who became an Israelite, not because of anything, but because she believed. God can do wonders to any man that believes. God does wonders to any man that believes. To believe in God is stronger than to do works. Because doing cannot do anything but to believe. Going to the mountain for many years, for many months, getting all the elements, a whole expression of unbelief. God does wonders through a man that believes than a perfect man. So, how does this aff affect us? How do we apply this explanation of the sheet of faith? The first application is in Acts chapter 4, verses 1. Now, I say that the shield can protect the soldier alone, but the strength of the shield is in formation when the soldiers come together. They form a long, thick wall or a long, thicker wall. On your own, yes, a soldier can protect himself, but it's stronger in formation. It forms a wall. So even when the enemy shoots the arrow and the fire spread, it still, it still will not penetrate. But if you are alone and the enemy shoots 
the arrow that has fire, it can spread and some of the fire can still touch you because you are alone. But when you are in formation, the war is longer, the war is thicker, the war is stronger. So there is no how. And the, the, even the, the war can be oval, like circle. So it's unending. The fire cannot, it will get to a point spread and stopped and stops. That's how strong the Roman soldier shield look like. Let's look at the first application in Acts chapter 4, verses 1, and 1 to 3, 18 and 23. In this class, you have to open your Bible. If you are not opening your Bible, write it down and check it afterwards. Or else, all I'm saying is we just be rhetorics. Acts chapter 4, verses 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed, that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day. So here, as Peter and his group began to preach in the name of Jesus, it caused an uproar and they were intimidated. Look at verses 18. Verse 18 says, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. Intimidation. As you go about to, to share your Christian faith, as you go about to live your Christian life, we are constantly in a spiritual battle and we will always face intimidation of this kind. Either you will not be able to talk about Jesus boldly, or either this intimidation can come in many forms. Intimidation can come diabolically. There could be attacks, arrows that are spiritual. You'll be intimidated. There could be arrows that are spiritual. There could be arrows that are physical. In this case, it was physical. They intimidated them. But also, intimidation can come in form of Spiritual attack. Now, the apostles were intimidated. How do they solve the intimidation? Go to verses 23. In verse 23, and being let go, they went to their companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Where did they go to? They went to their formation. It is very, very important for you and I to belong to a group of believers. They went back to their formation where all of them brought out their shield. Intimidation, we can be intimidated by sin, we can be intimidated by fear. We can be intimidated by Satan. But in this case, this intimidation came from the religious leaders. And what did the apostles do? They went back to their formation. See what they did in their formation. Verse 24. So when they had did, when so when they had that, when they had that. They raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are our God. You are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of your servant David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The king of the earth look, they took, took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you are anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever, you, whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now look, Lord, look on their threats, intimidation, and grant your servants that with all boldness they may be able to speak your word. Verse 30, by stretching out your hand to heal and the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. When they had, they, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together 
was shaking and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Power came. Don't forget, the greatest expression of faith is prayers. So Paul, in writing this Ephesians, we can imply by saying that the shield of faith is when believers stand together in prayers. The shield of faith is when believers stand together in prayers. The strength of the Roman army's shield is in formation. So also when the apostles were intimidated there, they went back to their formation and they all gathered together and prayed. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. There is power when believers come together. But don't also get carried away. When believers, when people come together and they are not saved, the church is not there. When people come together, and they are not saved. The church is not there. The church is not a building. The church is, the body of the believer is a temple of God. So the church is not the building. The church is blood-washed people. When blood-washed people come together, that is shield of faith. When we come together as believers, there is tremendous power. Acts 2, 47. Let's even start from 46. So continue daily with, the, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They had their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. When those who are not saved, comes together. There's no church there. That's why Paul, first of all, spoke about the first three armor of God. Truth, righteousness, gospel. Before he began to talk about the unity in prayers. Sheet of faith is just unity of prayers. Unity in prayers, that's all. Sheet of faith is because he didn't talk about the faith. He talked about faith and the greatest expression of faith is prayers. So he's talking about unity in prayers. So he, is not, he did not bring unity in prayers until he had established the first fundamentals, your feet planted in the gospel. Because your feet is not planted in the gospel, now sheed yourself, unity in prayers. Come together in unity in prayers. When we come together, when we unite in prayers, it repels the enemy's harrow. It becomes impenetrable when we come together in unity of prayers. You saw the apostles when they were intimidated here, they went back to their formation. The same thing happened when Paul, when Peter was in prison in Acts 12. The church came back together in unity in prayers. Even when they, did, they didn't believe how that prayer would be answered, still God answered because there is tremendous power when believers come together in unity in prayers. Now, when you go to a place that you call church, but it's not church because there are people who are not saved, there's no shield there. When you go to a place, you call the place church because it has building, it's beautiful, they have money, all right? And there's no church there. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, the true church, which is when believers come together, is so powerful that the harrow of the enemy, both the physical harrow and the diabolical harrow, could, cannot penetrate when true believers come together to pray. That's the meaning of this word. Nothing complicated, nothing complex. But I love the way Paul arranged it first. He first of all established what you wear permanently, become born again. Then in that case, don't stay alone. Look at Acts 2, 42, 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So those who are in the church were saved. And those who are 
those who are in the church were saved, and those who are saved were not kept outside. Those who were in the church were saved, and those who were saved were not left outside. So if you have found the Lord Jesus, don't stay in isolation. Go and join brethren. Become part of the brethren. A cord of three foods cannot be easily broken. Be part of the brethren. Don't stay in isolation. First Prayer chapter 5, verse 8. The enemy roars around looking for someone to devour. The strength of Satan is in isolation. Don't let Satan isolate you. Particularly at such a time when we live that everything is pluralized. We don't even know what the church looks like. I think one of the things Brother John should do is how to find a church. I think Brother John should do a teaching on how to spot a, a church, how to find one, how to locate where you can call church. Because not all you see around is church. And it is dangerous for a believer to be redeemed. Now you are in opposition and you are fighting this battle alone. It's very dangerous to be alone. Yes, you'll be protected because you pray, but you don't have enough strength to stand this spiritual battle. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail against it. There is attack, constant attack on the true church. That name you bear has put you in opposition. Don't fight the battle alone. Locate a true church. Brother John, don't forget, do a teaching on how to locate a true church. I won't have time to finish to do that. I would have loved to do that. But let Brother John do that for us. Maybe the next topic could be how to find a true church. What are the characteristics of a true church? How do you know one? If you are in a place that is not a church, what should you do? But I don't pay attention to that. So the meaning of shield of faith is the formation of the believers. It is very strong. Now, I'm not saying that every church is a church. If people who are gathered there are not saved, the church is not there. But when saved people come together, there could be two, there could be three, there could be four. That is a church. And the shield, that strength, that faith of the shield of faith is so strong and it's impenetrable because Jesus himself made that promise. I will build my church and the gate of hell will not prevail. Application one. Let's go for let's go to application two. The shield, the shield works in formation. And now we can start substituting shield of faith for prayers or prayer of the brethren or prayer of unity. So what Paul is trying to say there is the shield of faith is when the brethren come together to pray together. So we can call it the prayer of the brethren. So this is when somebody is saying, I am your covering, I am your shield. You come to my church, I'm your covering. That is not a church. Because no man can be your covering. He has his own shield. If that pastor is born again, he has his own one shield. You too, you have your own one shield. Your brothers, your wife, your sisters, they all have their own one shield. We all are protecting ourselves in prayers. So if a pastor says, I am, I am your covering, just know that pastor is a liar. No man can be your covering. Christ is. So we can say the shield of faith is the prayer of the brethren. The shield can serve as a repellent. The shield can serve as a protection for an injured soldier. So, oh, Father, I thank you. Uh, this is getting interesting. When a soldier is injured, apparently he cannot fight at that time. So, he enjoys the shield of other soldiers. Why he heal up? When he is healed, he too will stand and join others in shielding themselves. So, we can put it this way when a brethren is injured, some are injured by sin, some are injured by fear, some are injured by Satan. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to lift such brother in prayers. That's why God in Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily 
those who were being saved. God did not leave those who were saved outside. He put them together. They should join the brethren. Because when you are injured in a battle, what do you do? You can't fight at that time. So you need the protection of other brethren. If you go to a church where they destroy your esteem, where the pastor talk down on you, where they don't even respect you. When they, if you go to a place they call church, and the, when you go there, they, they, they are, you are not protected. Your mind is not protected. Your emotion is not protected. They don't respect your values. Take, for example, one of the satanic things we do in our African church is that we do women's conference, mm, Mother's Day. And in, on the Mother's Day program, you ask mothers to dance forward with their children. What have you done? You have injured those who don't have children. That is not a true church. You have injured them because they are already going through a burden. Now you are dancing out with your children or mothers that have children. I know some churches that will say the real mother should come forward. And when they say real mother, what's the meaning of that? The mothers that have children. What about those who don't have children? Because this is life. We are all biological, biological elements. Some are going to have biological complications. Some may not be able to give birth for life. In a place called church, we should be cognizant of that. They need love. They need comfort. In some churches, you have, they call some Sunday uh, jeans, Sunday jeans. So everybody put on jeans. What about those who don't have the money for jeans? So they look odd out. I remember how I felt when I was in primary school. I went to an expensive primary school, but my parents were not very rich. So when we were having end of that party, all that children's dress, oh my God, excuse me. I, well, 1992, I went to primary school. In primary school, my, my colleagues, my, my mates, wore, I mean, they called them, uh, what they call those clothes in those days? Uh, ready-made, yeah, they called it ready-made in those days. My parents gave me Agbada. Agbada made from Ofi. And the shoe is made of the Agbada too. So when we got to school, there was nobody that looked like me. I only looked like myself. <laughs> looked like an old man. I felt terrible. It battered my esteem. I was just by myself because I looked odd one out. Can you imagine doing that in a place called church? Can you imagine calling dress code in a church? What about those who don't have the money? So they feel like they, are, they have problems. That's not a church. That feeling makes them to go do whatever. So in the next time they call dress code, I can also dress like them. You see that spiritual warfare is also in the place you call church. A true church protects injured soldiers. Some are injured emotionally. Some are injured by sin. Some are injured by a tragic loss of a loved one. Some are injured by abuse. We should hold them up in prayers. The shield of faith is not to protect you alone. It's to protect the formation. That's why prayer meeting is not an optional course to a true believer. You only want to go for Bible study. You don't want to show up for prayers. It's not an optional course. There's power in the prayer of unity in, for spiritual battle. When we come together as brethren to pray together, you, we become impenetrable. That formative war becomes strong. Strong to protect those who are emotionally down. They find comfort. Those who, those who Satan has battered because maybe by the problem of their homemaking or by the problem of their ignorance, they became an attack. They, be, they became attacked by the devil. When they come to the true biblical church, they have shield. 
we stand in prayer for them. And because of the encouraging words that comes from the church, they heal up so that you can stand. Because of the comforting words that comes from the church, they heal up quickly and they too can stand. But if you go to a place you call church where you don't heal up, your wounds are expanding. Your emotional wound is expanding. Your spiritual understanding of spiritual battle is not settled. You always need that man. You are not in a church. You are in something I don't understand, but it's not called church. So the second application of the shield of faith is that the church is a protective zone for injured soldier. This is why we need a fellowship. We need to fellowship with true born-again believers. If we fellowship with people who are not born again, there is no shield. And you all of you are killing Satan. You are binding Satan. Oh, Satan, I bind you. You are just exposing yourself unnecessarily. There is no shield. The shield of the believer's gathering is not the pastor. The shield of the believer's gathering is what Christ did for all of them. The Holy Spirit has sealed us with Holy Ghost of promise. All of us. When we come together, there is tremendous power. Let me tell you a story about my associate pastor. About this time last week, his 11-year-old son was hit by a moving truck. His 11-year-old son was hit by a moving truck. I want to find what he wrote. That would be an encouragement to you, some of us. Let me show you what my associate pastor wrote. Where are you? Just give me one minute. Let me find this thing. All right, got it. All right, about this time last week, I want to get this. All right, you see it now. Okay, about this time last week, my associate pastor's 11 year old son was hit by a pickup truck. And the boy was, the 11 year old boy was rushed to the hospital. The doctor said his brain was severely damaged, so he was placed on life support. The church began to pray for 24 hours nonstop. The line for prayer was opened nonstop. Eventually, two days after, the 11 year old boy died. The church continued praying for this pastor, for my pastor, nonstop till Sunday till now. There's prayer going on nonstop. You know what that prayer did? The prayer did not stop the boy from dying, but the prayer was able to heal the pastor to go through the pain. If that was my country, would have named that man rather than stand. Because there is people suffer tragic loss. Things happen, brothers and sisters. There's still evil in this world. There's still evil in this world. Christ has redeemed the saint, but he has not redeemed the evil world. The guy, 20 year, 20, 28 year old driving their pickup truck, you don't know who he is. You don't know what has hijacked his mind. Maybe it was a drug, maybe whatever. He even was able to penetrate that guy to kill that boy. But if you see the response of the boy's father, let me read it to you. In this immense sadness that Vanessa, that's his wife, and I shared with you all the news that our dear sweet Jude passed away. The boy's name is Jude. Just after midnight this morning, this is the most at breaking thing we have ever experienced. Just this past Tuesday, Tuesday morning, we were shoving snow together before school and now it's gone. We are grateful beyond words for all for your all your love and support over these past days. This is the church. 
We, re we read all your messages and are thankful for them. Even if we do not respond, throughout all this, we have felt the nearness of our God. <laughs> the man who lost is 11 year old son. Ultimately, it is God who is sustaining us. We don't understand this bitter providence he has sent our way. But through tears, we say, the Lord give and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We are finding solace in the fact that Jude is now with Jesus and has entered into the joy of his master. One day, by faith, we will go to be with him again. This is the hope our faith in Christ gives us to journey through this immense sorrow. If that was my, my country, you call it, you say it's not a pastor. You say it's not anointed. How can his, how can his 11 year old son die? That's what you will say. But the church, because he was injured, seed of faith is holding ourselves together in prayers. So he was injured, but the church continually prayed for him. There's non-stop, non-stop prayers so that his faith will not fail, so that he will not give up the hope of the faith, so that he will not be discouraged, that God will protect him and heal him. Brothers and sisters, he has stood up on his feet. Shade of faith. One, it repels the attack of the enemy so that it doesn't penetrate. But should in case one of us is falling, a fallen soldier, we shield that person why that person is now amazed and that person is healing, we are shielding that person in prayers to the point that he too, he or she too, can stand up and join us in the battle. So a true church is a place where brethren pray. In this light was why Paul said, pray in the spirit. We will get there towards the end, verses 18. Paul said, pray in the spirit. We will just start boom, 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 thinking praying in the spirit is praying in tongues. In context, praying in the spirit is praying in submission to the will of the spirit. Because in verse 18, Paul said pray in the spirit. But verse 19, he gave an example of the praying in the spirit. He said, pray for me. That power or trust will be given to me. To preach, to boldly preach the gospel. That is what, that is what, what it means to, preach in the, to pray in the spirit. Forget about yourself. Pray for others. That is spirit-inspired prayers. Spirit-led prayers. We, we turn praying in the spirit, we just start praying in tongues. Oh, man, who told you? What's the meaning of that? So we are giving meaning to that text in isolation. But looking at the built-up case, Praying in the spirit is not in isolation. It's praying as led by the spirit. Praying spirit-inspired prayers. Praying to submit to the will of God. And if that is the case, what is the primary importance in the, will, in the mind of the spirit? 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. Pray for all men in authorities that will be able to live a peaceable life. Now God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. That there's one God and one mediator between, the, between God, the man Christ Jesus. That is the most important in the heart of the Spirit. The most important in the heart of the Spirit is the salvation of souls. And when Paul said, pray in the Spirit in verse 18, by verse 19, he said, pray for me. Not that I will leave the prison. Not that I will have food in the prison. Not that the NGOs will come and give me clothes in the prison. Not that this prison room, they will change it for me. Nothing personal. Pray for me that I will be able to preach the gospel boldly. All trials will be given to me. Even though I'm in chain. It didn't say pray that this chain will be broken. Say so still pray. And you know what? The answer to that prayers gave it to Ephesians, Colossians, Timothy, and Philemon. The answer to that praying in the spirit that Paul prayed in the prison gave birth to the four New Testament books. If all you know is Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Colossians, you are a good Christian. 
That is the meaning of praying in the spirit. Today, sheet of faith is praying in the spirit. It is the prayer of the brethren, for the brethren, for the lost, for, for the unredeemed. Is the formation that happens when brethren come together in prayer. That is what it means to pray in the spirit. I've given you two applications about the sheet of faith. I'm surprised that my pastor did not lose hope. I'm surprised that my pastor's faith did not give up, that your 11 year old son could die. But you know what my church kept doing? Up to today, they are still praying for the family. Not that the son will rise up, he's been buried, but praying for him that his faith will not fail. He is injured. So we need to shoot him with the shield of faith to the time where he will heal up and it will be able to stand to join us to shield others. That is the shield of the spirit. That is the shield of faith. Putting ourselves in the formation. Brothers and sisters, some people are hot. Some people are injured by abuse. Some people, Satan has injured their consciences. Some people are depressed. Some people are in anxiety. Some people are really, really attacked by the enemy. Some people, it's even their family that entered into occult and there's a lot of occultic manipulation. We need to put the shield of faith to protect ourselves. So that's why when they got saved in Act 2, 47. God did not leave them outside. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord had there to the church daily those who were being saved. Those who were in the church were saved. And those who are saved were not left outside. Brothers and sisters, take up the sheet of it. Keep believing the true gospel. Take up the sheet of faith. Keep believing the true gospel. Believe that God cares for you. And cast your cares upon him. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast your care upon him, for he cares for you. In your pain, in your anxiety, in this battle, keep believing God. Keep believing, have a resolute trust in the God that the gospel clearly tells us. Believe the God of the gospel. Believe that he cares. And if you believe that he cares, cast your cares upon him. Let's, look at, let's take this uh, classical example and we'll draw the cutting on the sheet of faith today. Luke chapter 2. Chapter 22, Luke 22, verses 31 to 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Spiritual prayers. Praying in the spirit is praying for the brethren. When you have your own need, still you are praying for the brethren. That is selfless prayers. James said, you ask, James, 1, James 4, but you do not receive because you ask with a wrong motive to spend on your own pleasure. Is that not what we do? Kill the enemy in my father's house. Oh Lord of my father. Now, this is December. Many people are in many camps now. They are all seeking self, 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 self. God will not hear. If any miracle happens, it's just providence. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked, this is Satan, who wants to sift Peter as you wait. But I have prayed for you. I have used the sheet of faith for you. I have used the sheet. You are protected with the sheet of faith. That's the meaning. You see the correlation between prayer and faith now. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. I have prayed for you that your resolute conviction in God should not fail. So look at it. He mentioned faith, he mentioned prayers. They always go together. The greatest expression of faith is expressed in prayers. 
Satan wanted to take Peter the way he took Judas. Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, straighten your bread. <laughs> It will, it will look like it will fail. And actually was injured. He denied his Lord three times. But Jesus looked at his fall. He saw beyond his injured time. And he saw a time when he will be restored. Because he has prayed for him. Peter was actually attacked spiritually. What you saw denying his master was a spiritual attack but it was in the shield of faith of the brethren. When he was weak, Jesus shielded him. The attack penetrated him. He was injured. And he, was, he fell. But the prayer of faith, the shield of faith, put him in the protected zone. And in his injury, he got to a time Peter was healed up. And when it was healed up, it too could now stand as a shield for others. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. But then, when you have returned to me, when you heal up, you to stand. Any preacher that makes you depend on him forever, perpetually, permanently, is not speaking for Jesus. The classical work of a preacher who is speaking for Jesus is to mature the believer. And to mature means so you two can stand. Jesus prayed for Peter, not only to heal, but to stand. And today we can see the work of Peter in the book of Acts. We can see the work of Peter in 1 Peter, 2 Peter. We can see the book of Peter in Galatians, this same Peter that was once injured. Let us pray as we bring this teaching to a conclusion. Let us pray for ourselves that God will keep us in the faith and God will keep our faith from failing. Just like Peter was restored for anyone who is injured right now, injured emotionally, Injured physically, injured spiritually. Let us pray that they will heal up. They will be strengthened. For anyone listening right now and you are looking for the fellowship of the brethren, let us pray for them. That God will guide you into the right fellowship where you will be nurtured and grown and grown and raised and discipled. I pray for that person who is emotionally abused, that you will heal up. You will find healing in the midst of the brethren. That the God of all comfort will comfort you on all sides. I pray for that person whose sickness can be traced to demonic attack. We ask for healing in Jesus' name. That you will heal up speedily. I also pray for that person who needs to Put on the helmet of salvation. Pray for that person I miss right now. Listen to me right now. That you are confused. Whether you are born again or not. Even though you are led to Christ. But every now and then. You are always confused. Am I born again? Am I not born again? That's a spiritual attack. It's attacking your brain. And that will be our next class. To look at the helmet of salvation. I'm praying for you. before Between now and then that you will hold on to your faith. You'll be grounded in the fundamentals of the gospel. You will have the confidence assurance that comes from it, knowing the truth in the name of Jesus. So, Father, Lord, we thank you for today's class. Thank you, Lord, for people listening and people who will listen afterwards, that they will remain strong in you, that in these trying times when everything only is desecrated, you will keep us by your power that the very elect will not be deceived. Help me. Help us. Help our brethren. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining today's class and God bless.